You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. In 1993, the federal government created the Empowerment Zone Enterprise Community Program as the capstone of the Clinton administration's community revitalization strategy. The goal is to empower people in economically distressed communities across the country to work together to create jobs and enhance employment skills. After failing to be awarded one of the initial grants in 1994, nine Cincinnati neighborhoods became a federally designated empowerment zone in January 1999. Those neighborhoods include Queens Gate, the West End, Over the Rhine, Mount Auburn, Clifton Heights, Fairview Heights, Coryville, Avondale, Walnut Hills, and Evanston. Originally, the federally, federal government promised $100 million over 10 years. In addition, the city of Cincinnati pledged $208 million of local contributions, while organizers held out the hope of creating 10,000 plus new jobs for residents in the zone neighborhoods. From the beginning, the empowerment zone has been plagued with delays and budget cutting, both in Washington and locally. Almost a year ago, 12 News reporter Jeff Hirsch highlighted two successes on the empowerment of the Empowerment Corporation. This is the New Blend Paint Company in Over the Rhine, a project which received an Empowerment Corporation grant. New Blend recycles old paint which otherwise would have been thrown away and turns it into usable paint. It also helps people who might have been thrown away as well. Well, without the Empowerment Zone, we wouldn't have the operation that we have here today. We were able to hire people that um, are from the neighborhood that otherwise wouldn't really get jobs. Another empowerment project, this neighborhood store in Avondale in a building which sat vacant for years. Cincinnati Empowerment Corporation will hold its annual meeting. To discuss the Empowerment Zone effort, I am joined by Harold Cleveland, the Chief Operating Officer of the Cincinnati Empowerment Corporation, and Lakita Cole, the Communications Director for the Cincinnati Empowerment Corporation. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you, Dan. Lakita, Thank in you. your case, welcome back. Thank you. Um, Harold, 2002, yes. you had a full year uh, opportunity to be in charge there. What can you point to as successes during this past year for the Empowerment Zone? Well, Dan, we, I think we have a lot of successes. We're uh, starting with uh, the two programs that uh, were in the, the preliminary clip. New Blend has expanded. Now they uh, occupy the entire uh, building of that space, so they're growing. And this is a building down in Over the Rhine, am I building correct? Building Over the Rhine. It's a building that, it's a business that's expanding. A $1 uh, continues to provide services. In addition to that, however, we've got... But, yes. in, but in, in, in cases of companies like that, let's use yes. that as a concrete example yes. since Jeff brought it up. What does your corporation do to help a company like that, concretely? In that, concretely, providing funds and resources. Uh, case in point, New Blend uh, funds to help them expand. In addition to that, uh, contacts and resources, helping them to make contact with other businesses. And New Blend's been a, been a prime example of a business that has expanded. Okay. There are other examples. I think uh, roughly 12 businesses have been approved for, when we say funding, uh, on the for-profit side, that is, the, those are loans. Then we have about 49 on the nonprofit side. Uh, one of the things that we've just uh, signed is DevCorp. It is a local development contract program, which will take 50 contract uh, companies, and out of that, we hope that 30 will be uh, certified to, to get surety bonding and expose them to contracts that they otherwise would not have had any exposure to. Okay. Lakita, um, one of the things in the zone is, and one of the reasons the neighborhoods that are selected, the nine neighborhoods are in there, is that they face some special problems, higher levels of poverty, higher levels of people without high school diplomas, et cetera, et cetera. You know, given the fact that this is a difficult economic time mm -hmm. for the nation as a whole, have you been able to create new, new jobs? Are there net new jobs for zone residents or in the zone? Yes. Um, we, we like to say over 35,000 residents have been um, either directly or indirectly helped through the CEC programs in which we fund. Um, in, in the beginning clip, it talked about the 10,000 jobs, um, and those were committed from the private um, companies in the city of Cincinnati. Of those, thus far, we'd say about 5,000 of those have been realized. And also, people must keep in mind is that 10,000 jobs is a commitment over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so we've already halfway have met that goal, and that's in terms of those private companies. There are also other programs in which we fund where, comp where people have also received jobs as well. 
for example, Inner City Health, they have um, placed about 182 um, residents in jobs, well and above what their projected milestones and say they, they say they. So these are do. people who live in the zone. The jobs don't necessarily have to be in one of those nine neighborhoods. Also, although, although that's a double advantage, but it could just be a job for somebody who lives in one of the zone neighborhoods. Correct. For example, CentOS, they you know hired. They were one of those um, who made a commitment that they were going to train and hire residents of the zone. They, are, as you know, they are not in the city of Cincinnati. However, they have taken residents from the city of Cincinnati and trained and hired those as well. Job training yes. uh, is always an issue. Yes. And is that something that your corporation? works with directly? Do you do job training or then do you contract with organizations that do job training? How does it work? We contract with organizations that actually do job training. We, as you, as you said, uh, these uh, neighborhoods uh, have been met with some degree of poverty. We understand that you just, in many instances, can't take a person uh, from unemployment to employment without some kind of training, something that uh, ensures some job retention. We failed if we have not helped a person to under, not just to get a job but to keep the job. So yes, we have funded uh, several organizations that actually deal with the job training and job retention. Okay, and uh, it's not just about jobs. Your mandate is also about civic improvement and strengthening the civic infrastructure, strengthen, strengthening home ownership. That was the goal. There's very broad goals. What about on fronts other than just job creation? What can you point to? Home ownership. We've definitely increased it in the empowerment zone. We have a program that we fund that um, provide. Well, actually, we provide the funding, but they do the work for us in terms of um, down payment assistance to homeowners. Um, they also they, they can to a cl take them through a class. For example, those homeowners that are not actually quite ready to purchase a home, they do credit counseling for them, and then they get them provided and get them ready to do the paperwork, take them through the nine-hour class, get them a certificate, and then we provide up to $250,000, um, $2,500, I'm sorry, to um, down payment assistance as well as up to $500 for appliance fees. Um, I can say there's approximately about 12 new homeowners that live in the zone, that mm -hmm. have benefited from our program, and we hope that that um, number increases even and more. And those would be those would be people who were already living in the zone, but were renters and are now homeowners. Not necessarily people who are living in the zone. It can be those who may have lived in another neighborhood but decided to move in the zone. We want to increase homeownership not only to those living in the zone as well, but bring people, other people, and we want to make the neighborhoods a, a living um, place for everyone. Okay, so people out, who live outside the zone can also benefit from your programs if they're interested in living in one of those neighborhoods. And of course, that's a, that's a lot of neighborhoods with a lot of, and there's a lot of interest in older housing. So there's a lot of... Uh, home stock. There. I would say, but bear in mind that our primary target is, you know, as we told the federal government when this, this program was initiated, the residents within the empowerment zone to raise their quality of life. Okay. So as Lakita is saying, yes, there are individuals that uh, can be helped, but our primary target is making sure that these residents in these nine neighborhoods have opportunities. You brought up the federal government. What the, the initial commitment, as I understood it, and as I tried to state it, was a hundred million dollars over ten years. I know that I, there has been controversy about continued funding. How much funding have you received up till this point, and what's your prospect for this coming year of federal funding first? Roughly, we've received about 21 million. Uh, about 15 million of that has been committed. About 7 million has already been drawn down. So we've made some tremendous progress over the last year, year and a half. And for uh, it, currently, we realize that there is uh, funding that is uh, projected for next year. Uh, as, you as you already mentioned, it was during, I think, the Clinton administration. However, what, what was brought out was it was a Republican, Jack Kemp, who uh, co-fathered that idea. So this is not just uh, a, uh, an initiative that is one-sided. This is a bipartisan program, and I think it's something that both Republicans and Democrats and e even independents can get their teeth around and say, this is not a handout program. This is about economic opportunity, and that's something that applies to all people. What is, the appropriations bills have not been passed, no. as we all know, on the federal level yet. Right. So you're still waiting. Are you in the, the I guess, HUD uh, uh, appropriation this year? Yes. And for what level for this coming year? 
Well, they're looking at, we don't have the specific amount, but uh, I believe it's something uh, somewhere between two and four. Uh, but but so again, this until is, something is voted, you know. This you, is much more modest, though, than the original $10 million a year. Is that, am I, am I, is that fair? Yes. Yes. It's not going to be $100 million over 10 years at this rate. Well, we can't say that. At this point, we're hopeful. Uh, okay. We, you know, we believe that uh, even $21 million is a significant amount of money. And uh, we are hopeful at this point, with four years remaining, that uh, we still can get to the $100 million. I think as the federal government sees more progress in these empowerment zones, because remember, you know, this, as in all corporations, is a startup. You know, when you're talking about the first two years, you're talking about startup. And we've had staff for two years, two years before that, that was bored, total of four, four years. That's, 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 you know, we're hitting our stride now, and we believe that 2003 is going to be the best year that we've, that yes. we've had. There's also, uh, Lakita was a controversy over the past year about local commitment, local funding, both from the city and from private corporations, and all kinds of numbers get thrown around. Uh, the one that I could kind of find that I could document and I used was the $208 million from the city. The question with the city funding was, does that mean additional funding or does that mean just any money they spend in any of the zone neighborhoods? Where do you stand with city support for this program? Actually, I'm going to yield that to our um, CEO who's been in talks okay. with the city. Yeah, we're very hopeful. Uh, we've, had some pro we've had some discussions with uh, the city. Uh, the city manager has uh, uh, set up meetings with uh, her assistant and uh, that has met with us along with Peg Myrtle who uh, as community development director uh, for the city, had some good talks. Uh, we've identified possible projects for the future. We're very, very hopeful uh, around the discussions that we have had and will continue to have and truly do believe that the city, uh, and they know this, uh, has to play a vital role in our success. Those empowerment zones that are truly succeeding are those empowerment zones that have a good partnership with the city. And the conversations that we've had thus far uh, seem very promising. Specific, what about resolution of this issue over any money spent in the neighborhood versus additional money spent in the neighborhood. Any clarification of that? It's still in discussion. Still you know, in discussion. Still in discussion okay. at this point. Uh, I don't want to be premature, okay. but I will say is we've identified possibly two to three projects that we'll, we'll go uh, in on. Also, we have, and I hope uh, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, I'll say there is a program around um, expanding businesses that we're looking at and the city's looking at specifically helping us uh, with that. Expanding so, existing businesses. Th well, that and startups. And start so uh, I am very pleased at this point. We have got some real discussions. We have a, uh, we've added new staff and one of our staff, Michael Cox, who is our, our business manager, has been in some real good talks with A, the city and the businesses. And we've got some exciting things. Can't tell it all now. At our annual meeting, which Lakita will talk about a little later on, we've got some exciting things we're going to talk about uh, around well, well, businesses. Uh, we only have about two minutes left, yeah. so let's. Uh, the annual meeting is this Thursday, and January we're January 23rd at yeah. Children's Hospital from 6 to 8 p.m. And in we're the gonna put Auditorium. Up, we're going to put that information up on the screen here just in a few minutes, uh, but. Anybody is welcome at that meeting, yes, is that correct? Yes, it's free and open to the public. The program will begin at 6.30 p.m. Um, as Mr. Cleveland alluded to, we will have someone from the city. We'll be discussing some of the partnerships um, that we're trying to accomplish this year in 2003. We're going to talk about what's new, also talking about some of the, our accomplishments over the past year and what we've done thus far and what we plan to do. If people are interested, and we just put up that information, the detailed information about the meeting, if people are interested in getting in touch with you, what's the telephone number? 487-5200. 487 5200 4, 487-5200. Five two zero zero. And I they apologize for not putting. They that can up. also um, check our website as well and get more additional information. And that address is www.empowercency.org. E e m p o w e r c i n c y dot org. Okay, Harold. One one last question. And we're taping this on Friday morning. Okay. And the Cincinnati Enquirer came out with a story about uh, funding or the project at the Liberty Theater and over the Rhine, which is part of the zone. Uh, has that project, at least at this moment, looks like it's fallen apart. Has the Empowerment Zone been a direct investor in that project? No, we have not. Okay, so you have not, that's, that's not. What about, the, the other story is about the redevelopment of the, the old Ford manufacturing plant in Walnut Hills, which uh, looks like it's going to be redone now. They've got a tenant. Have you been involved in that project? 
I believe from our business uh, manager there has been some discussion, very preliminary, I believe, but there's no, been no money invested, but certainly something we'd be interested in. Any success within the empowerment zone, we believe, is a success for all the residents and really a success for the entire city. So uh, to the extent that uh, we can lend a hand to that, we certainly uh, stand ready. Well, good luck with your annual meeting this Thursday night. And uh, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Thank Dan. you for your work. You, and we'll be, we'll be in touch. Thank Stay you right very there. much. Uh, there we go. If you're interested in finding out more about the Empowerment Zone, the annual meeting will be held this Thursday night, January the 23rd. The meeting will be in the Saban Auditorium at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and the doors open at 6 o'clock with a meeting starting at 6.30. Stay tuned. After the break, a look at the maturing relationship between Cincinnati and its Ukrainian sister city, Kharkiv. Just now, it's a hard time for our country. We have lots of problems. But we have also a great will to overcome those problems. That was Cincinnati's sister city, Kharkiv, Ukraine, in 1991 when I visited as part of a cultural exchange. The relationship between the two cities has continued to mature over the past 12 years. In May 1991, the Soviet Union was teetering on the edge of oblivion. The economy was in shambles, and the ordinary people of the city wavered between despair and expectation. Through all of the agonizing changes of the past few years, committed people both in Cincinnati and Kharkiv have continued to visit back and forth, sharing ideas and expertise. One vehicle has been provided by the Center for Economic Initiatives. Since 1997, the center has sponsored 13 study tours for over 200 Ukrainian business people to experience American techniques of management and marketing. For 2003, CEI has won a grant from the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, to sponsor four new study tours. To discuss what is in store for Cincinnati Kharkiv relationship in 2003, I'm joined by the president of the Center for Economic Initiatives, Lee Cole. Lee, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Uh, what is the model that you use? in this particular area of economic exchange. This is not, there's a lot of other types of exchanges yeah. going on, but in this area of economic exchange, mm. what is the model you're using? Well, the, mar the model is the Marshall Plan, the original Marshall Plan, because when we first became interested in doing something in Kharkiv, and actually Ukraine and the rest of the Soviet Union, I read an article by in Foreign Affairs magazine called Jumpstarting Ex-Communist Economies <coughs> by a James Silberman. And I eventually met him, and it turns out that he was the person who conceived and ran the original technical assistance program for the Marshall Plan. And he's 89 today. He's alive and well. I talk to him frequently. He <laughs> advises me on what to do. And does, do other organizations in the United <coughs> States who are involved in sharing with uh, Eastern Europe use this same model? Um, we are the only people that use the model. There are a couple of others who use the name, but th they're really doing the same as Community Connections. So program. in one of these groups, you're going to bring over four groups this year, right. what actually happens? Who are the people who get invited to be part of this <clears throat> group? Well, first of all, we select the people um, in Kharkiv. We go over, in fact, we're going over next week, and we will have a competition and we will interview um, 30 to 40 people, and we'll bro boil it down to 16 of the, the best people. So 16 people in a group. That's <clears throat> and these are all business leaders. They are the heads of their uh, firms. They're the decision makers in the firms. <clears throat> and so we go through the selection process, and then about two to three months later, they come over on the tour. And Cincinnati is the base for the, for the tours. They come here stay in the Vernon Manor Hotel while they're here. They stay in the hotels all the times because we want them to, s to get a feel for the entire industry. They don't just visit one firm. They'll visit about 25 firms th throughout the Midwest, and they'll be traveling by bus. And they might go as far as Iowa. Um, they might go see John Deere, the Mo ADM, Monsanto, plus Cincinnati firms. What? Uh 
can you point to, I mean, there can be these exchanges, can you point to something in Ukraine that has actually changed because of these tours? No, I have many, many examples. Um, let me just give you a, I'll give you a couple of okay. simple ones. We had a dairy tour and they came over here and they were looking at the dairies over here and we all know hot air rises or actually cold air sinks and they found that in the United States all the cooling systems are located in the ceilings. In Ukraine they were always lo located on the floor and they thought well of course it makes sense to put the cooling systems up, up high. So they went back, they put the, the uh, systems up, one company froze all their milk because it was so much more efficient to have the <laughs> cooling systems up high. And in fact, they save about 30% of their energy because of that. Um, well, one of the areas that I, I noticed in a newsletter is that people through these tours to yeah. Cincinnati and Ohio have become fascinated with the potential of soy. <clears throat> yes, soy has been a great success because when we first started the tours, the dairies, for example, couldn't get enough milk. Now, it's partially because Ukrainian cows didn't produce as much milk as an American cow. But, um, so they came over here, we took them to ADM, and they saw the, the benefits of soy. And they went back, and very little soy was grown in the country, so the dairies started asking the farmers to now grow let's it. remember, Ukraine is the, literally the breadbasket of, of that part of the world. Yeah. I mean, it's very yeah. rich agriculturally. Incredibly and rich they, soil. And they didn't grow... They soy. didn't grow soy. Okay. Um, they had thought about it a few years ago, but they hadn't done much about it. Well, now the, the, one of the dairies is, that makes condensed milk, um, the white condensed milk is 50% soy and 50% whole milk. So they've been able to double their output because of the soy. And the, their uh, chocolate condensed milk is 100% soy. And they have other soy products, and it's, the soy is starting to take off. So farmers now grow soy. They now have markets for soy. There's a whole new area there. And, and their productivity, the profitability of the farms has gone up because you can be more profitable growing soy. You know, one of the things that fascinated me when I was over there coming out of the TV industry was they didn't understand anything about advertising. <laughs> has that changed in 12 years? <clears throat> well, it's changed a little. You have to change the mindset. When we first went over there, the idea was you only advertise if you're trying to get rid of junk, <laughs> which is not the American way, obviously. Um, and we would tell these companies, don't just have a truck go down the street that says milk or bread. And it would literally say that. It would, it would say that. And it was written, painted on by hand. So it, it did not have any sales appeal. And we'd say, this, this truck is a moving billboard. Use it. Tell it that you have the world's best milk or you have healthier bread or, and, and use it and, um, as a tool. And we're now starting to see that. The, the marketing programs have changed uh, greatly because when the participants come over here and they see the marketing here, it is just an eye-opening experience. In a general way, has the Ukraine... Has Ukraine embraced a market economy in a macro sense, or is it just individual companies are making it happen? Um, it's an interesting question. The, um, they are all trying to make it happen, um, and, but it's hard to change an entire economy of 50 million people, and the government doesn't totally get it. Fortunately, we brought some government officials over, and they saw how a how this economy works. In fact, they went back and they deregulated the price of bread is one of the things. Construction contracts are now bid. They didn't used to be bid. They were given to their buddies. Uh, so th we, we have seen changes um, and we're known, actually we're known all over. When I stand in Kharkiv, I will s see people all the time that have come on these tours and g come up with a big embrace. <laughs> Well, we're out of time now. This is, I mean, it's really important because Cincinnati is playing a role in transforming uh, the economy across the, around the world. Thank you for your work. Let's keep us informed, and we'll have you back later in the year. Fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We leave you this morning with an excerpt from a presentation by historical reenactor Hassan Davis. He brings to life York 
the only African American in the Lewis and Clark expedition 200 years ago. Mr. Davis will be performing this Thursday night at Ryle High School at 6.30. For information, call Nancy Jordan Blackmore at 859-384-4416. My name is York, just York. It's the name my daddy carried before me. I was born a slave, no. I was born to be the slave of another man. That is the shame my daddy carried before me. But I have seen a world that few white men might ever dream of. I have climbed to the top of snow-capped mountains I have swum rivers so swift that buffalo lose their foot. I have watched whales dance across the blue waters of the ocean. And I have walked among the people, those Americans that 